Hello and welcome to GD Life at Pulse. Uh, this is part two of the GD Science Practice Test 1 in 2021. Um, if you haven't watched the first part yet, you can find it on our YouTube channel. If these videos and practice tests help you in any kind of way, please hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so you get informed whenever we upload new things that can help you to pass your GD tests. Okay, let's continue with our test. So we already answered question 1 to 18 and we will continue with question 19 through 35 in the second part of the video. So question 19 and 20 are based on the information that we can see below. An atom contains neutrons, protons and electrons. The atomic number of an element is the number of protons in one atom of that element and the atomic weight is equal to the sum of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. The chart below lists the numbers of protons, neutrons and electrons in three common elements. So we see the elements carbon, nitrogen and oxygen and their respective numbers of protons, neutrons and electrons. Drag and drop the appropriate element into each box. For this practice test write the element letters in the boxes. Okay, so the element with an atomic weight of 16. How do we figure that one out? So it just told us earlier in the text above that the atomic weight here is equal to the sum of protons and neutrons. That means we have to look at the number of protons and neutrons of the different elements and add them together and whenever we get 16 that's the element we're looking for. So for carbon we have 6 protons, 6 neutrons, 6 plus 6 is 12, nitrogen 7 plus 7 is 14, oxygen 8 plus 8 is 16. So our first element is oxygen, so we write the letter C. The element with the atomic number 7. Atomic number is the number of protons in one atom of that element. So which element has 7 protons? That is nitrogen, so our element here is B. The element with the atomic weight of 12. 6 protons, 6 neutrons is carbon. 6 plus 6 is 12, so the last one is carbon. A. Number 20. Based on the information in the table, which of the following is true? A nitrogen cation, which has one fewer electron than does an ordinary nitrogen atom, has an atomic number of 7. Fluorine, which has an atomic number of 9, has more protons than does oxygen. Boron, which has an atomic, num an atomic weight of 10, and an atomic number of 5 has more neutrons than does carbon. An oxygen anion, which has more electrons than does an ordinary oxygen atom, has an atomic weight of six uh, of 15. So let's go maybe from bottom to top. Oxygen anion, two more electrons, uh, which will give it a negative charge. Um, that, however, does not change its weight. Electrons don't have an effect on the atomic weight. It's the protons and neutrons that affect the atomic weight, which means the oxygen anion will still have a weight of 16 with 8 protons and 8 neutrons. So we can eliminate answer D. Boron, which has an atomic weight of 10, and an atomic number of 5 has more neutrons than does carbon. Carbon has 6 neutrons with 5 protons in boron. Getting to an atomic weight of 10, we need 5 more neutrons. So boron has 5 neutrons, carbon has 6, so we can exclude C as well. Fluorine, which has an atomic number of 9, has more protons than does oxygen. <coughs> The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. That means uh, fluorine 
A fluorine atom has nine protons. Uh, oxygen has eight protons. So it looks like our answer B is the correct answer. A nitrogen cation which has one fewer electron than does an ordinary nitrogen atom has an atomic number of seven. So it seems like um, there is a little mistake in the test here um, because answer A is a correct statement as well. Um, it says a nitrogen cation which has one fewer electron than does an ordinary nitrogen atom has an atomic number of seven. Yeah, the number of electrons has changed so the number of electrons goes from seven down to six. However, the proton number which is the atomic number will not change. So that remains seven as well. Um, yeah. So these two statements are actually correct statements. So whoever designed these questions, um, there is probably a mistake in one of the two answers. Question 21 and 22 are based on the information and chart below. The Richter scale measures seismic activity or energy released in the form of heat and vibration during earthquakes. The scale is logarithmic, base 10 scale, which means that an earthquake measuring 3 on the Richter scale has a shaking amplitude 100 times more powerful than does an earthquake measuring 2. The chart below shows the classifications and effects of various earthquakes and their measurements on the Richter scale. So we see the Richter scale down here, less than 2, from 2 to almost 3.9, from 4 to 4.95 to 5.9, 6 and so on. And here we see the classification and their effects. <coughs> 21. An earthquake causes severe structural damage to a house located within 150 miles of the epicenter of the quake. Which of the following is the best likely description of the earthquake? The earthquake was less than a moderate measuring below 5 on the Richter scale. The earthquake was moderate measuring between 5 and 5.9 on the Richter scale. It was strong measuring between 6 and 6.9. It was major or great, measuring more than 7 on the Richter scale. So let's see the effects of um, the moderate to great uh, earthquakes from 5 to 7 or greater. <coughs> 5 may cause damage to unstable structures. It says here causes severe structural damage to a house located within 150 miles. Strong can cause damage in areas up to 100 miles, so we're still greater than 100 miles, 150 miles, it says in our question. Um, a major can cause damage in areas several hundred miles larger, uh, can cause damage in areas several thousand miles large. Um, answer D goes over 6.9. Um, again, we can exclude uh, A. We can exclude A, B and C because our building we are talking about uh, gets severe structural damage 150 miles of the epicenter. That means it must be over 6.9 since 6.9 says damage of up to 100 miles, not above. So the correct answer 21 is D. An earthquake in California measures 4 on the Richter scale and an earthquake in Taiwan measures 6 on the Richter scale. According to the information in the passage, what is the ratio of the shaking amplitude of the earthquake in California to the shaking amplitude of the earthquake in Taiwan? So you can have a little think about that one. So I can give you a hint. It says up here in the text 
100 times more powerful than does an earthquake of 2. 3 on the Richter scale is 100 times more powerful than an earthquake measuring 2. That means when we have a step from three to two, three is, oh, we are on a ratio of one to a hundred. That means if we go from six to four, we have two steps, which means we have to multiply 100 by 100 and that means our ratio is going to be 1 to 10,000. The correct answer in this question is thus. D. Question number 23 and 24 are based on the following information. In an ecosystem, each living thing plays a specific role in the food chain. For example, in the forest, mice eat leaves and snakes eat mice. The path that energy takes can be shown through the following food chain. Leaves, energy is transferred to mice and from the mice, energy is transferred to snakes. Or we can read it as mice eat leaves, whereas snakes eat mice. The food web is another way to demonstrate how energy is transferred from one species to another within an ecosystem. The figure shows a food web of an ocean ecosystem. In a food web, living creatures fall into the following categories. We have autotrophs, which are organisms that create their own food and do not gain energy, uh, do not gain their nutrition from other creatures. We have primary consumers or herbivores that eat plants, algae and other producers. We have secondary consumers which eat primary consumers, tertiary consumers which eat secondary consumers and we have apex predators which are at the top of the food chain and have no predators other than humans. Consumers can be carnivores, creatures, organisms that eat meat or omnivores which are organisms that eat both plants and animals. Question 23. Which term accurately describes the role that the elephant seal plays in this ecosystem? Let's see where the elephant seal is. Down here we have algae. This is definitely the producer level. Um, and we can see the elephant seal is located here. So a little bit further up in the food web. But the elephant seal is not the apex predator. No, the apex predator we can see here is the killer whale. So what is the role of the elephant seal in this ecosystem? He's an autotroph. He's a primary consumer, a secondary consumer, or an apex predator. So we just said that he is not an apex predator. The apex predator is the killer whale. An autotroph, again, what are autotrophs? It tells us up here what autotrophs are. Autotrophs are organisms that are able to create their own food. So the producers of the food web, algae, are autotrophs. <clears throat> Some protists are autotrophs as well. Elephant seals are not at the base of the food web. That means they are not autotrophs and they depend on their food eating or on their energy needs uh, eating other organisms. What do elephant seals eat? They eat squid and we can see that squid are organisms that feed on algae and protists. Algae and protists are the producers, the autotrophs in our food web. That means that squid are the primary consumers or one of the primary consumers in our ecosystem. And since the elephant seal feeds on the squid, the elephant seal must be a secondary consumer. So answer C is the correct answer to question number 23. 24. In the ecosystem above, if the population of krill were depleted, going down, which of the following consumers would be the most affected? 
So basically what happens to our food web if the krill population decreases a lot, depleted, used up basically. So in this food web we can see that the only organisms that eat krill are the penguins. That means that the population size of penguins will probably decrease. <coughs> Um, so penguins is not a one of our possible answers but we can assume that when krill decreases the penguins decrease as well so if penguins is not one of the possible answers let's see what comes after penguins after penguins in our food web comes the leopard seal that feeds on penguins so if krill depletes that means population size of penguins will decrease and that will affect leopard seals negatively and we can see that the leopard seal is one of the possible answers so it's probably the leopard seal let's have a look at the other three options cod a cod is neither related to penguins or krill so we can exclude Caught from our answers. Squid again is not connected to krill and is not connected to penguins so we can exclude squid as well and same with the elephant seal. The elephant seal is not connected to penguins or krill in any kind of way so we can be confident with our answer C. Question 25 when humans come into contact with objects that inflict pain, they reflexively move away from those objects. Consider the example of a person who touches a hot stove. Provided that the person in question has normal motor abilities and has not suffered nerve damage, he or she will almost instantly draw away from the stove. Such action is initiated when sensory receptors in the skin detect dangerous heat levels. These receptors send signals along the axon of the receptor cell to spinal interneurons in the spinal cord. The spinal interneurons excite the motor neurons that control the arm muscles, which in turn send signals to the muscle cells. The muscle cells then contract, causing the arm to move away. Using the information above, drag and drop these steps that show the process that occurs when an individual touches a dangerously hot object into the diagram below. So what options do we have here? We have motor neurons are excited, muscle cells contract, heat is detected, spinal interneurons are signaled and muscle cells uh, are signaled. So we have to bring these in the correct order from detecting the stimulus to the final action of drawing away the arm. and. The correct answer is basically given in our paragraph above. Um, and everything starts here. Such an action is initiated when sensory receptors in the skin detect dangerous heat levels. So that means our first step is C. Heat is detected. What comes after detecting the heat? These receptors send signals along the axon of the receptor cell to spinal interneurons in the spinal cord. So we go to spinal interneurons are signaled by the receptor cells that have detected the heat. So our next letter should be D. What comes after the spinal interneurons are signals? Let's check our text above. The spinal interneurons excite the motor neurons. Do we have this down here? Muscle cells contract here. A. Motor neurons are excited. What comes next? That control the arm muscles, which in 
turn send signals to the muscle cell send signals to the muscle cell what are we left with uh, we have a we have b left and e left muscle cells contract or muscle cells get signaled send signals to the muscle cells so our next letter is e and the muscle cells then contract causing the arm to move away muscle cells contract So first reading all these four or five boxes at the bottom, having to put them into the correct order, um, just with this little information in the boxes uh, can be quite difficult or seems quite difficult, but don't forget that you have your paragraph on top. And if you read again and look for the keywords that are given to you in every single box, you can easily find the correct order in this question. Twenty-six. A research, a research team plans to conduct an experiment to test whether a certain chemical compound causes outbreaks of hives in average adults. In total, hundred adults volunteer for the study. The, re the research team plans to divide the test subjects into two groups: an experimental group that will be exposed to the compound, and a control group that will not. Both groups will be monitored for any reactions. When the research team interviews their volunteers, they find that 60 of the volunteers are chronic sufferers of rashes and hives due to allergies. To ensure the best result from their experiment, how should the researchers handle these 60 chronic allergy sufferers? A. They should all be included in the experiment since they are representative of the overall population. They should not be included in the experiment since their chronic condition might unduly influence the results of the experiment. They should be included only in the experimental group because they are more likely to show the results that the scientists are looking for. They should be included only in the control group because the chemical compound might be more dangerous to them than to others. So since these researchers want to test whether a certain chemical compound causes outbreaks of hives in average adults, we are not interested in looking at people who already have hives since this would yeah, eventually influence our test results. So in this case, we don't want any test uh, or subjects or persons taking part in this experiment to be already sufferers of chronic hives or allergies. That means the researchers should exclude these people from their experiment. A particular aircraft has a mass of 1,800 kilograms and has engines that provide 90,000 newtons of thrust force. A second aircraft has a mass of only 1,500 kilogram but has engines that provide exactly the same acceleration. What amount of thrust force do that aircraft engines provide? You may use a calculator. So they even give us the formula here, force equals mass times acceleration. So it tells us that the second aircraft has exactly the same acceleration as the first one. Um, that means let's find the acceleration of the first aircraft to figure out the acceleration of aircraft two. To do that, here we have the formula force equals mass times acceleration, F equals MA. What do we know of the, about the first aircraft? We know we have a mass of 1,800 kilogram and a force of 90,000 newtons. We are looking for the acceleration, so we have to rearrange that formula to find A, so we have to bring M over on the, to the other side. How do we do that? We divide by M, that gives us F equals 
uh, a equals f over m. Um, if you are not comfortable rearranging formulas, I can only recommend whenever you see a formula like this, create a formula triangle. Um, that's fairly easy. You just look here, okay, you can see force equals mass times acceleration. So in this case, mass times acceleration goes down in the triangle and on top goes force. If your formula is written another way, like here, we can see F over M equals A. Whatever is on top in the fraction goes in the top of the triangle and the other two things go below. So how do we construct the formula using the triangle? Whatever we are looking for, we can pick out of the triangle. Let's say we are looking for force. That means force is mass times acceleration. Or we are looking for mass. That means it is force over acceleration. Or we are looking for acceleration. And we can see this is force over mass. <clears throat> so that's always very helpful if you're not comfortable or not confident rearranging formulas. If you are given a formula, just quickly create such a formula triangle and you can easily figure out the different arrangements of the formulas whenever, yeah, whatever you're looking for. So in this case we're looking for acceleration. We have the values. Force is a 90,000 Newton divided by 1,800 and that is equal to 50. So let's use units as well. Newton, kilogram, the unit of acceleration is meters per second square. Now we know the acceleration. We know that the mass of the second aircraft has the same acceleration as the first. The mass of the second aircraft is different. It is 1,000. 500 kilogram, same acceleration, times 50 meters per second square. And that will give us the thrust force of the second aircraft and 50 times 1,500 uh, 1, should be 75,000 Newtons and we have this answer that's possible that is answer C. Twenty-eight scientists use index fossils to identify the times at which unidentified fossils and certain sediments were deposited. They hypothesize that if a particular fossil is found near an index fossil in the same layer of rock then the two fossils were likely from the same time period. The shorter the lifespan of the index fossil species, the more precisely scientists are able to correlate that species with the particular error. Therefore, it is not surprising that ideal index fossils are therefore from short-lived, common and easy to identify species. Which of the following is an example of the effective use of index fossils? Scientists fix the time that Mesulinellus hyperborea existed in the late Nevadella era because they find this organism near and in the same level of rock as Limnifacus persiculum, a recognized index fossil that existed in that period. Scientists determine that this organism were probably mud bottom dwellers because Heulitha, which existed during the same time period as uh, our organism we're looking for, were also bottom dwellers. Scientists hypothesize that Mesolinus hyperborea were wiped out by a sudden climate change that occurred at the end of the Devonian period when many other trilobites were wiped out. Scientists determined that Mesolinus hyperborea did not exist in Iceland because Petriana 
Pool Menta, a similar trilobite did not exist in Iceland. So, uh, many scientific names here, not easy to pronounce. Um, as we can see in the text above, it tells us what the use of uh, index fossil is, and the use of index fossils um, is that we can use them to uh, correlate them to other species that lived in the same particular era when they are found in the same layers of rock. So, um, our Mesolinellus hyperborea is probably, as it looks like, the organism we want to know something about. And in this case, uh, answer A must be the correct answer, because this is the only answer um, that relates uh, this organism uh, having lived in this specific era. Why? Because they find fossils of Mesolinellus hyperborea near and in the same level of rock as yeah, this organism here, which is recognized as an index fossil. Again, index fossils, when they uh, can be used to determine in what uh, era other organisms have lived when they are found in the same rock layer as the index fossil, which exactly answer A says. Um, answer B doesn't really make sense. No, it tells us uh, that our organism we're looking for um, hypothesizes something about um, its biology, um, its behavior, that it was a bottom-dwelling organism. Um, just because we find the organisms in the same uh, layer of rock, that doesn't tell us anything about uh, their biology and position in an ecosystem. Um, yeah, so the correct answer here, or the only answer that makes sense is A. Twenty-nine. Boyle's law explains some aspects of the behavior of gases, such as those in our atmosphere. The law states that if temperature remains constant, volume decreases as pressure increases. The graph below illustrates Boyle's law for one gas. Again, what does Boyle's law say? If temperature remains constant, volume decreases as pressure increases. We can see pressure increases on the x-axis, which causes the volume to decrease on the y-axis. Which of the following is supported by the information of the graph? Pressure and volume are directly proportional. As the pressure rises from one atmosphere to three atmospheres, the volume decreases from two liters increases from 2 liters to 8 liters. As the pressure rises from 1 atmosphere to 2 atmospheres, the volume decreases from 8 to 2 liters. If the trend in the graph continues, then when the pressure reaches 5 atmospheres, the volume will be near half a liter. So, directly proportional in answer A. Directly proportional means when the pressure doubles, the volume doubles. So that is not the case when our pressure doubles, the volume is halved. Um, as the pressure rises from one to three atmospheres, again, B doesn't make sense either, no, so we can exclude A. Actually, our relationship here is anti-proportional, not directly proportional, so the opposite of proportional. Um, as the pressure rises from one to three atmospheres, uh, again, pressure increase, what should happen to the volume? It will decrease. Here it talks about increasing the volume with an increase of pressure, so we can definitely exclude answer B as well. So it's either C or D. 
and uh, C, let's have a look at C as the pressure rises, volume decreases. Okay, that makes sense. Let's, let's see if the numbers make sense as well. Rises from one atmosphere to two atmosphere. So where are we on our graph? One atmosphere is here, so we are at a pressure at a volume of eight. To two, at two we are at yeah, around four. So the when we increase the pressure from one to two, the volume should decrease from eight to four. It says from eight to two liters. That means it's probably not C as well. As I said earlier, the relation is anti-proportional, which means when we double the pressure, one to two is doubling the pressure, the volume will half eight and four, four is half of eight. So if we look at four, a pressure of four atmospheres, we are at the moment at a volume of vo yeah, around about one liter. That means if we increase the pressure to five, we will again half the volume. The volume is one liter, half of one is 0 0.5 or one over two. So our next point on the graph will be round about here, which is 0 0.5. Let's see what answer D says. If the trend in the graph continues, then when the pressure reaches five atmospheres, the volume will be near half a liter. That is definitely correct. 30. Mass is an indicator of the amount of matter that an object possesses. Scientists determine the weight of an object by multiplying its mass by the acceleration that the object experiences due to gravity. The acceleration due to gravity on the moon is approximately 1 over 6, uh, a sixth uh, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. Based on the information above, a person would have less more weight mass on the moon. Um, yeah, as it says here, mass is an indicator of the amount of matter that an object possesses. That means uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, since you are still you, the amount of matter in you stays the same. That means the mass of your body stays the same as well. Whether you are on the moon or on the earth, your body has the same mass. The weight is determined um, by multiplying the mass of an object by the acceleration. Uh, that the object experiences due to gravity. It says that the gravity of the moon is weaker. That means you will be accelerated less by the moon's gravity, which means your weight on the moon will be less than the, your weight on Earth. So that means the correct answer here is based on the, in the information above, a person would have less weight on the moon. Why? Because the gravitational field strength is about a sixth of the gravitational field strength of Earth. Scientific theory holds that convergent evolution occurs when different species independently evolve analogous structures or features that may appear different, but perform the same function. Creatures evolve such structures in order to adapt to their environments. A scientist argues that bats and birds have analogous structures. Which of the following supports his arguments? that use echolocation to track their prey, while birds rely primar primarily on sight. Unlike bird wings, bat wings are composed primarily of a membrane, but both types of wings provide flight capabilities. Baby bats gain nourishment from their mother's milk, while baby birds eat worms and bugs brought by their mothers. Both bats and birds frequently make their homes in trees, bridges and attics. Okay, let's look again what the important information in our text above says. So it's about convergent evolution. Um, when does it occur? When different species independently evolve analogous structures or features that may appear
appear different but perform the same function. <clears throat> Creatures evolve such structures in order to adapt to their environments and these environments are often similar in the species that have evolved convergently. So comparing bats and birds, what do both bats and birds have? They both have wings which are features of these organisms. They have different underlying structures. The wings of bats um, are composed primarily of membranes whereas the bird wings are made of feathers mainly but both provide the ability to fly. Again what did it say? Perform same function. Function here is flight may appear different, different underlying structures made of a membrane and beds between the bones whereas made of wings in birds. So we have a similar structure, different underlying structures, same function, that is answer B in this case. Uh, echolocation, again that is a different function here, birds and Bats locate their prey in different ways, not the same environment. Birds hunt, at, hunt, hunt during the day usually, whereas bats hunt during the night time. Um, yeah, we're the same with baby nourishment, uh, different food source, different, different way of hunting. Um, D could be a trap. Both bats and birds frequently make their homes in trees, bridges and attics. Uh, well, that is more behavior than features of the organisms or structures. So the correct answer is B in this case. Question 32 and 33. The scientist conducts a study to determine the effects that certain substances have on those who suffer from polyuria or excess urine production. During a two-week period, the 500 volunteers participating in the study drink two liters of water per day and do not consume any other liquids. During the next two-week period, the same 500 volunteers uh, drink two liters of caffeinated diet soda per day and do not consume any other liquids. During a final two-week period, the same 500 volunteers drink two liters of water containing a mild amount of salt per day. The scientists tracks each volunteer's urine output each day. The volunteers all followed exactly the same diet in the first week as they did in the second week and in the third week. The average daily urine output per volunteer for each of the two week periods is shown below. So the graph shows us during production after consuming different substances. So you can see tap water around 200 milliliter per day, uh, caffeinated diet soda 300 and salt water around 100. Let's have a look at the question 32. The data support which of the following conclusion? Individuals suffering from polyuria may benefit from drinking caffeinated diet sodas Individuals who drink water with a high salt content are more likely than others to suffer from polyuria. Individuals who suffer from polyuria should avoid consuming large amounts of caffeinated diet soda. Individuals who suffer from polyuria should vary their liquid consumption by drinking some water, some caffeinated diet soda and some slightly salt water. Uh, we can definitely exclude answer um, D here uh, because the study doesn't give us um, any uh, information about mixing these different drinks so we only get information about consuming one or the other over a longer period of time. So what about the other three answers? Which one is supported by the data? We can see in the bar graph that 
individuals who drank caffeinated diet soda or when they drank caffeinated diet soda they had the highest urine production that's basically what we want to avoid in people who have polyuria that means they should avoid drinking excessive amounts of caffeinated diet soda. Do we have that in one of our answers? Yes, we do. Individuals who suffer from polyuria should avoid consuming large amounts of caffeinated diet soda. That means answer C is what we are looking for here. The passage indicates that the volunteers followed the same diet during each week of the study. Why was this important? Had the volunteers varied their diets throughout the study, the difference in urine production may have been attributable to differences in solid food consumption rather than liquid consumption. Had the volunteers varied their diets throughout the study, they may have carved different amounts of liquids each week. By eating the same foods each week, the volunteers ensured that they did not suffer from any nutritional imbalances throughout the study. By feeding the volunteers the same foods each week, the scientists ensured that the volunteers produced uh, that same amount of urine as each other per day. <clears throat> so this is a controlled variable and usually in an experiment we want to control as many variables, meaning making as many things that we are not testing for the same to avoid any of these variables we are not testing for to affect our results. So the only answer that's talking about uh, food having differences in food having an effect on the urine production is answer A. Um, that is the correct answer here. Had the volunteers varied their diets throughout the study, the differences in urine production may have been attributable to differences in solid food consumption. And that is correct. If the people would have eaten different things, um, then we, yeah, we couldn't be confident whether our data is due to the different drinks or eventually different foods they, eat in, they ate in the different weeks. To, so to be confident that these results are really based on what they drank, we need to keep as many possible other factors the same during the three test periods. Question 34. Chemicals can be classified as acidic, neutral or basic depending on their pH measurements. A pH below 7 indicates that the substance is acidic. A pH of 7 means that the substance is neutral and a pH above 7 means that a substance is basic. An indicator is a chemical compound that, when added to a substance, changes color based on the pH of the solution. For example, cabbage juice is an indicator that turns blue when added to a basic substance. Based on the information and the table above, which of the following substances, if combined with cabbage juice, would cause the cabbage juice to turn blue? We can see in the text above that it says um, pH above 7 means that the substance is a basic. There is only one substance that has a pH above 7, which is ammonia. And that means adding cabbage juice to ammonia would turn ammonia or would turn it blue. So ammonia is the correct answer here. Question 35. Geologists classify rocks in three main categories, igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic. Igneous rock forms when melted rock cools and hardens. Below ground, igneous rock forms when melted rock known as magma cools in small pockets. Above ground, igneous rock forms when volcanoes erupt at and spew lava that cools and hardens into igneous rock. Sedimentary rock forms when minerals or organic particles accumulate and settle in a specific place on Earth's surface or within a body of water. Metamorphic rock forms when existing rocks are transformed by heat and pressure and as a result experience profound chemical and physical changes. A student discovers a rock that he hypothesizes may be igneous. Which of the following supports the student's hypothesis? The rock has undergone profound chemical changes at some point in its history. Um, again, which rock undergoes profound chemical changes. That was the last one we learned about. That was metamorphic rock. 
transformed by pressure, profound chemical and physical changes. So we can exclude answer A. The rock was found within an underground lake. Um, sedimentary rock forms when minerals or organic particles accumulate and settle in a specific place on Earth's surface or within a body of water. So that means we can exclude B as well. B points towards sedimentary rock. The rock was found near the site of a recent volcano eruption. <clears throat> the rock is composed of minerals. C or D, um, I go for C. That sounds much more reasonable. We see igneous rock uh, forms when around above ground igneous rock forms when volcanoes erupt and spew lava that cools and hardens into igneous rock whereas it says for sedimentary rock forms when minerals or organic particles accumulate the rock is composed of minerals so that speaks for sedimentary rock as well and we can exclude answer D Two. So the correct answer here must be C. That's the end of the first GD science practice test in 2021. That was part two. If you haven't watched part one yet, I highly recommend you to do so. Um, yeah, if you like our videos, if they help you to prepare for the GD test, um, then please <coughs> subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, I hope and I wish the best for you passing your GD tests and I hope to see you in the next practice test for science. Goodbye.